It's hard to believe that 70 years ago, this quiet field in the north of France was living hell. It was here that 800 Newfoundlanders went over the top and advanced towards German lines just down over this ravine. Over 700 of them were either killed or wounded. The Royal Newfoundland Regiment was virtually wiped out in less than an hour. Today, there are still silent reminders of that battle. Iron rods that were used to string barbed wire, trenches and craters, once filled with mud, now grown over with grass. The roar of the guns has given way to the soft chirping of the birds. The shattered woods and the devastated countryside have been restored. And now another group of Newfoundlanders is headed to this battlefield. Old veterans whose vivid memories of war have not been dimmed by the years, and young teenagers who know so little about what happened here so long ago. Together, they're making a pilgrimage to no man's land. There are nearly 3,000 miles of ocean between northern France and the shores of Newfoundland. But when the Great War was destroying much of Western Europe, its effects were felt all the way to the small villages here. Recruits from Newfoundland were anxious to join the army. Sailors, school teachers, lumbermen, and fishermen like Hubert Miles. Hubert is 87 years old. Today, he lives in Stephenville Crossing, but he grew up in Change Islands where he fished with his father. He was just a boy when the war started, but eight months after the Battle of Beaumont Hamel, Hubert Miles left home and went to war. He would have gone sooner, but he was too young. Well, I was fishing up to Labrador when the war broke out in 1914. Well, I was 15 years of age then. And when I became 17 years of age, I enlisted and went over. Mother and father wasn't very well pleased about it. They didn't want me to go. Mother didn't want me to go. Father didn't want me to go, see. But he said, well, what's the use? The other boys was going. He just wouldn't let them go, too. Hubert Miles spent more than a year in France and Germany during World War I, and now he's going back. I never thought I'd be going back to France for 70 years after the war, see the same old place again. This is a time of mixed emotions for Hubert. He is glad to be going back, but it's a return to a place and time he has sometimes wished he could forget. But he never has, and he never will. I think it's a great idea of bringing down those three young people and give them some idea of what it was like in the First World War. Bullets whiz by. The scene is tragic. Blood flows freely. The dead lie everywhere. Charmaine Corcoran of Mount Pearl is one of the three young people going along on the trip. Her essay about an old war veteran took first place in a high school contest sponsored by the Royal Canadian Legion and it won Charmaine a trip to Beaumont Hamel. Charmaine is typical of her generation. She's into rock music and baggy sweatshirts and knows little of a war that ended half a century before she was even born. I don't know much about war, only what I've learned through school. When I wrote my essay, uh, I didn't need to know a lot. It was like, and I don't know a lot about it. Only what I've seen, um, I've gone down to see the parades and seen the veterans with their medals. That's all I know. Saturday night, June 28th, at St. John's Airport. Hubert Miles meets one of his old comrades from World War I, 87-year-old John Cater of Grand Falls. This is my first trip over since I came home. Well, I hope you enjoy it. I hope so, How are you? Fine, it's done. The third veteran to make this trip is 92-year-old Ephraim Cooper of Clarenville. The three men have a lot of years to catch up on. I'm fishing on there all my life. That's all. Yes, I was 37 years in Labrador. I was 17 years master of schooner, in the armed schooner. Canadian Legion Vice President Fred Williams arrives in the lounge area with Charmaine Corcoran and the other two students who were contest winners. How you do? Cindy Palmer, Charmaine Corcoran, and Randy Bale. Cindy Pollitt is from Springdale. 
Rodney Whalen, is from Conception Harbor. The three teenagers are excited about their first trip to France. The three veterans, a little more subdued, probably because of the memories of their first trip and the reason they went. Dawn comes early on a flight from Newfoundland to Europe. Passengers who plan to settle in for the night soon discover that they're quickly in today. For most, it's a normal plane trip, a time to relax, a time to sleep. For Hubert Miles, it's a time to remember. His mind goes back to the last time he crossed the Atlantic Ocean under very different circumstances. Oh, yes, there's a lot of difference in going overseas today and what it was when, in my, when I went over the first trip. Now, now of course, it only takes you about uh, just a few hours, six or seven hours, and you're there. We had to spend 12 days and 12 nights. There were around about uh, a thousand altogether troops on our boat, but what you thought? We encountered a couple of submarines on the way, but they got rid of them all right. We never seen the submarines, you know. There, 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 was, an, there was a report there were submarines, and then the, the destroyers got after them and chased them away, you know. And they got clear of the submarines all right. We never got, we never got no damage at all. We were lucky. Several hours later, Hubert Miles sees the villages and farmlands of France. He can hardly believe his eyes. Hubert remembers this countryside as a sea of mud, burned out trees, and shattered houses. This area of northern France near the Belgian border is mainly farm country. Fields of grain stretch as far as the eye can see. Well-kept villages and a pleasant countryside have grown out of a devastated wasteland. At the Beaumont Hamel Memorial Park, the statue of the Newfoundland caribou stands guard over the old battlefield. In the middle of the park are the trenches where men once huddled in misery. Halfway down the slope, the danger tree, where German machine gun fire was especially deadly and many Newfoundlanders fell. And down in one corner are the clean white headstones. They mark the graves of Newfoundlanders who died in the battle. French children from neighboring villages sometimes come to the Beaumont Hamel Park to play in the trenches. The boys say they play here during their summer holidays, mostly hide and seek. They don't know much about what happened here, only that there was a big battle with a lot of soldiers. Soldiers lived in these trenches for months and made the best of their terrible conditions. These mud holes served not only as a line of battle, but also a kitchen, a bathroom, and a bedroom. The average soldier spent very few days in actual battle. The rest of his time was spent in the dull routine of trench warfare. It's hard for young people like Charmaine Corcoran to appreciate the horrors of living in a mud hole. But for Hubert Miles, the memories are still vivid. Hubert fought at Passchendaele, 120 kilometers from here. But life in the trenches was miserable no matter where you were. Yes. What happened if you got hit? What happened when we got hit? Well, we just had to get out of the line, McGuad. <coughs> get out our, our uh, uh, bandage, you know what we call a fuel bandage, and put the bandage on your wound if, we, if, we, if, we, if it was all right to walk, and then you'd get out. Somebody would help you out, a stretcher bear would help you out. If you wasn't but many were not helped out. They died right there in the mud and were buried in the debris. I know when I was up on Passendale Ridge, there was a place on the pummy section, I could say around, just about there, when there was a guy's leg used to stick out about that far, and his putty and arm was on it, you know, 
I used to hang my my uh, kit on that for several <laughs> things. I kit on that lake. Because you couldn't dig a trench up there without dig, digging ground, you know. So many people was killed up there. That they couldn't dig the trench without digging up on their people that were buried there, see? Well, it's too, almost too bad for the, for the, to talk about to the young race, you know, people, because they ought to believe it. Today, you wouldn't have the thing. We used to have lice. I tell you now, we were so bad and lousy going through those trenches that those days was like this, the warm days, we'd take off our shirt and hunter for it and stick them onto a rifle like that and take our bayonet, chop off the lice off, of the, off our, our shirts. That's as true as you're there. The men who enlisted for the war were anxious to get to the battlefront. They wanted to prove themselves. Their spirits were high but they soon discovered that war was no picnic. <laughs> Hubert Miles remembers his first impressions of France. Everything was broke, I mean, since your state, and then, and you're under shell fire, oh, my God, you don't know what it was like by. Sometimes it'd be like this. There'd be, there'd be days you, you wouldn't do nothing. There'd be only scattered gunfire all day long, see? Next thing probably you know when you'd have to go to and uh, get an advance or get out of your trench and get back from where you were. Germans would take you, drive you back so far. Next day you'd drive them back again. Oh, boy, threats are serious. You know what? It, uh, today, it, the young race of people now, like you fellas, would, would think would, would do just like murder. You know, just like killing cattle. Try to kill all you can, get all you can, that's what's all, eh? Hubert admits the men were often demoralized, but simply had no choice but to keep on going. It was fierce, boy, it was fierce in the trenches. It was unbelievable. You young people could hardly realize, if we tell you, if we tell you, uh, you could hardly believe it. Even myself, if somebody would tell me that I wasn't there, if I wasn't over to tell me, I'd hardly believe them. Because, you see, the horrors of war was worse than war. You, you imagine staying in those trenches 10 and 15 days when you get there down pouring rain, something like that. You see your soil is there. Well, that stuff would be about up to this, and that would be just like pot pug, you know? You st you'd have an awful job to get, get through it, see? There was a, and then you'd have lots of rats, all oh, the rats was millions, my son. But this is not a forgotten battlefield. The sacrifice of the Great War is still very much alive in the hearts and minds of Europeans. The visitor's book at Beaumont Hamel is filled with names of people who come here to remember. Yes, I'm a bit, a bit lost for words, really. I'm finding it very, very moving. And it's just, it sounds, that sounds very ironic, but it's bringing it to life. I mean, it's something that you hear about in the history books and you hear about in school. And but you can't really grasp it if you haven't, but this brings it a lot, a lot closer. The Beaumont Hamel Memorial Park is especially attractive because visitors here can see the great battlefield much as it was. And this year there are more tourists than usual. This is the 70th anniversary of the famous July Drive of 1916. Did you have it pictured this way? I just had a picture of like a graveyard with puppies, right? The image you'd get. And uh, it wasn't... I didn't picture as many people died. The graves, you see the graves around, there's so many graves of 18, 19 year olds. It's really, really sh shocked me. I can't see people my age now willing to do what they did at their time. The tr you know, the troubles they went through. I don't know if we'd be so willing now. Why were they willing to go? We put that question to John Cater. Well, the government of Newfoundland uh, uh, issued a proclamation asking all people who were qualified and uh, of the appropriate age to enlist. The country needed them. Newfoundland was Britain's oldest colony. We were loyal in our support to the, to the Great Britain, to the Empire. And uh, as a Newfoundlander, I guess we all felt that we should get involved. Ephraim Cooper went to war after his brother had already gone and had been badly wounded. He looks back on it somewhat philosophically and with a touch of humor. I had a brother shot right through the chest. He survived? Hey? Did he survive? 
he survived till he was 72. And I went over and went in the same company that he was in. In B Company. It's a matter of record that thousands of men died here in one day. But their reality doesn't sink in until you see the well-kept cemeteries and the rows and rows of white headstones. The Commonwealth countries have set up a special war graves commission. It has been charged with maintaining these military cemeteries forever. Cindy Pollitt and Rodney Whalen are amazed at the ages of the dead soldiers. Many of them were only 18, the same age as the two teenagers. I knew that many Newfoundlanders died here. I didn't know a real good history on it. I mean, we just did it briefly in school, right? I never ever met a veteran, a veteran of the war. So, you know, I, I never paid very much attention to it. I should have. But until I have spoke to the veterans and came and seen all these headstones, of most of them unknown, you know, I can feel it now. And when I go back, I'll never forget it. If more young people realize just how much destruction war has caused over here, because we're so removed from it back where we are, they just don't realize. And if they did realize it, I think there wouldn't be any more wars. Hey, Ash Porter. Well, I said, that's the fellow I was looking for. This fellow, no, do you know him? No, you don't know him. I just heard him. Hey, H. Porter? Yeah, I hear talk of him, you know. Ash Herb. That's Herb Porter. Yeah. That's the one I went to school with, Ephra. Yeah. Hubert Miles and Ephraim Cooper spend some time in the Y Ravine Cemetery looking for familiar names. No, but no names on them. Seen them too. No names on them. On many of the headstones, there are no names. Side by side in this small cemetery, young Newfoundlanders who grew up hundreds of miles from each other. Private Malcolm Cyril Mahaney, age 23, son of Mrs. Elizabeth Mahaney of Carbonear. Private Edward Carrigan, age 21, son of James and Isabel Carrigan of Placentia. Private Douglas Snow, age 19, son of Charles and Patience Snow of St. John's. Private Edward William Butler, age 25, son of John and Phoebe Butler of Fogo. Every summer, dozens of tour groups visit the battlefields of northern France. There are more than usual this year because it's the 70th anniversary of the huge offensive on July 1st, 1916, known as the Battle of the Somme. What happened to the Newfoundlanders at Beaumont Hamel was a small part of a massive tragedy which saw 60,000 British troops killed or wounded on that one day. George Hudson was a 17-year-old sniper with a Scottish battalion. The British had bombed the enemy lines for a week, and Hudson remembers the promise from his officers that few Germans could have lived through it. But as soon as the barrage lifted and the order was given over the top, the Germans came up out of those just like swarms of bees. And all our fellows went into the barbed wire entanglements. Many hundreds of them were entangled in the barbed wire. Those that got through them met by hail of fire were absolute death. Martin Middlebrook is an English author and has written what many people consider the definitive history of the July offensive. Well, this is one of the big stories of the 1st of July, the way the Newfoundlanders were sent over the top in a completely hopeless venture. The early attack at 7.30 had broken down. The survivors of it were pinned down in no man's land, taking shelter in the grass, in the shell holes. And orders came in the middle of the morning that two battalions, the 1st Essex and the Newfoundland, Newfoundland, should I say, um, were to attack. A very paltry preliminary bombardment took place. It probably had very little effect on the German trenches. The communication trenches between the reserve trenches where the Essex and the Newfoundlanders were was clogged with wounded, was being shelled. The Essex took their time to get up to the front line trench and never went over the top at the right time. The Newfoundlanders, however, went over the top at the correct time, but from the reserve trench. 
There was nobody else moving on the whole battlefield. Every German machine gun within sight engaged them. They started suffering casualties from that moment onwards between the G British support line and the British front line. Then they had to thread their way through the barbed wire defences, the British barbed wire defences, the gaps that had been made. And a lot of dead were found in those gaps after the battle. Then the poor fellows that actually got as far as the, the battlefield itself, no man's land, were pinned down, the same as every other unit. I doubt whether a single German soldier was killed or wounded by the attack of the Newfoundland Division, and the, Divi uh, the Newfoundland Battalion. And as you know, they suffered 710 casualties. There was only one other battalion, the 10th West Yorks, suffered the, exactly, funny enough, exactly the same number of casualties on the first day. So it's a horrible record to hold that uh, your people lost all those casualties in what was a quite hopeless venture in the middle of the morning. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. July 1st, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Underneath the caribou at the base of the Newfoundland Memorial, the ceremony of remembrance begins. This is the climax of the pilgrimage for the three war veterans and the three teenagers. They stand just a short distance from where the young men of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment stood 70 years before, awaiting their doomed charge into no man's land. The Minister of National Defense, George Hees. We are here in Picardy to commemorate all those who were ordered to achieve the impossible and died in the attempt. That was 70 years ago. But this pilgrimage poignantly reveals just how large a place the small village of beaumont Hamel occupies in the history of Newfoundland. A sizable crowd has gathered for the service. Many are tourists. Some are townspeople from the nearby villages of Beaumont and Hamel. There are few left who remember the actual battle, but the sacrifice of the Newfoundland Regiment is still remembered and admired. They were heroes. Their glory will never fade. We in Beaumont Hamel and the surrounding villages will never forget them. They will be in our hearts forever. May they all rest in perfect peace. Hubert Miles is called upon to read the act of remembrance. They shall not grow not whole as we that are left to grow whole. Our age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn at the going down and not the, of the sun. And in the morning, we shall remember them. We will, we will remember, remember, them. remember them. It's customary at remembrance services for the federal government to lay the first wreath. But today, that custom is waived. The three veterans have the honor of going first. The final wreath is laid by the three students. Representant la jeunesse ternevienne, Mademoiselle Charmaine Corcoran, 
and Cindy Pollitt and seeking Monsieur Rodney Whalen. Mm -hmm. The ceremony ends with the piper's lament. The service has lasted about 40 minutes. That's 10 minutes longer than it took enemy machine guns to all but wipe out the Royal Newfoundland Regiment on this same spot on the 1st of July, 1916.